Max and Natalie are gonna show us their rig. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so first, what do you have? What do you got? Uh, we have a 2003 Land Rover Defender 110, and um, it's not an ass spec. It's a German spec. Um, she's done 130 she? odd. Yeah, she. She's called Emma, and it's short for Excellently Maintained Magnificent Automobile. <laughs> and. Um, She's done 130,000 miles, so 210,000k, and uh, so far she's done really good. We've had a couple of problems with the lights and a little bit of an oil issue, but other than that, running completely smoothly. All right, this is where we spend most of our days, and uh, tablets, the navigation system, basically. And here's where we have all of our electric installation. And yes, we do know what each cable does. And the inverters in there, and all of the relays for the heated seats, and the light bar on the roof. Everything's packed in there, so if there's an electrical fault, we know kind of where to look and what to swear at, basically. <laughs> Uh, so, because we're going to be driving through a lot of dusty environments, um, we put a snorkel on. So we had to exchange the whole uh, air intake system, because Land Rover's own has a bypass that if there's too little pressure in the snorkel, it sucks the air in from right underneath the car. And if that happens in water, the water goes through the air intake system into the engine, and then it's dead. So this one's a Cyclone snorkel. You have the, the normal air rams snorkels that point forward, so you suck in all the dust through this way. And in this, the air gets spun before it gets sucked into the snorkel, and then the dust just falls out of the vents, and so you get far less dust in it than if you do with just an open air ram snorkel. So we put um, aluminium on the fenders so that we can step on them in order to get to the pot on the roof or the jerry cans and to sit on it and put tools and whatnot on it and uh, we usually have the water out here. This thing is a snow cover and it's there because the usual Land Rover air intake for the heating system not for the engine, but for the air that gets pumped into the cabin. It's just an open grill. So when you get to snowy conditions, the thing regularly freezes over and the, the heating system doesn't get any air through. So this way, there's always an opening for the air that gets pumped into the cabin. And um, because we've driven through two blizzards already, it's basically paid for itself. So the logo on the hood is the only decal that we put on ourselves. And it's custom made by a local artist from Hamburg. And he um, has a range of like, t-shirts and stickers and stuff like that. And um, we were allowed to pick one. That's, uh, and he gave it to us for free because he liked the idea of our travel so much. And it's pointed south at the bottom of the hood because that's the direction that we're going. Tom. Most, most of the pictures include this guy. They are, uh, they're called freaks. You can see them all over Hamburg, pretty much. Oh, most of his pictures? Yeah, yeah, it's always... Most of the times it's a guy with his face. And that's... And they're always tattooed. Yeah, they're Every just called freak. Yeah, everything's tattooed. He has a, has a chef with two knives sticking out. And uh, then there's a sailor. That guy and a couple of, couple of punks as well. Yeah. So this is where we live. It's always a bit messy. <laughs> this is uh, basically living room, bathroom, kitchen of sorts and the uh, bedroom all in one. So we have half of the bedroom upstairs on the roof 
and then we have half of the bedroom down here, meaning that we can sleep either in the tent or if it's too cold or too windy or Thunder. thunderstorms, um, we take the bottom sheet of plywood out and flip it 180 degrees and then we have a bed in here. So in here, everything has its place. This is our kitchen of sorts. Then we have the stuff that doesn't fit anywhere else. Up here is the cutlery. That's the kitchen. Yeah, that's the first aid kit. And then in here is the bathroom stuff. Yeah, we don't want to see that. <laughs> that's lights and everything that's to do with fire. So we have the kettle, the fire gloves, and uh, all kinds of stuff that you do at night anyway. And then up here is the most important part. Electronics, electrics, and how we document everything. Hey, you built this all yourself. We built all of this ourselves, and um, we wrote the plans for everything ourselves. And it took us about three months to build, because we were working at the time. And uh, might maybe even a little bit longer. This was the first piece that we started and the last piece that we finished, as it always is. And uh, we basically had a look on the internet for, let's call it inspiration, because we read some blogs of people that had done a similar trip or through similar climate zones and just read about what they were complaining, what wasn't working in their overland rigs. So we basically just did the opposite of what they did. And so far it's worked out okay. We had to repack a couple of times and put stuff that was in there and here and the other way around. But other than that, it's done all right. So this is the, the epicenter of everything that happens. It's the fridge. And um, what, what fridge is it? It's an Engel 35 liter fridge with a digital thermometer. <laughs> and uh, we chose this one because it's the one that people least complain about when talking about fridges. So it's got a lifetime warranty and um, it draws very, very little current for, uh, for the, the, the freezing power that it has. I mean, you can freeze this thing down to minus 18 centigrade, so that's 10 Fahrenheit. But we just use it as a fridge because we keep mostly beer and food in there. So the compressor in this thing is basically like it's uh, fixed like a lamp on a ship so it adjusts to its surroundings automatically and uh, you can go up to 60 degrees each direction and the compressor won't be affected by it at all so the coolant doesn't slush about so the cooling power is always there unless you tilt the truck in which case probably the coolant level in your fridge isn't the most worrying thing at that point and this is where we keep all the tools so we have ratchets we have sorted nuts so you have to do all the work yourself yeah. yeah so we do most of the most of the work that we do on the like all the maintenance and Everything that needs fixing, we do ourselves as far as we can. I mean, we had an oil change done recently, but that was because it's the last Land Rover specialist for the next about 30,000 miles. So we wanted to have it done properly before we start messing about with it. But uh, we've got, we're pretty, pretty well sorted out. We have uh, a power drill, we have a Dremel, and uh, so we can, fix a lot of stuff ourselves and we do as well so 
everything that's kind of loose and creaky we just have the right tools for the job to get it to uncreak basically uh, 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 oh yeah <laughs> so we're doing this trip for a charity and the charity is viva con agua it's a local charity from hamburg and they build wells in underdeveloped countries and um, so they've done They've built wells in, in Ghana and Nigeria and Ethiopia and Nepal and in Ecuador. And the whole thing started in Cuba. So they built the first well in Cuba. And we found five people and companies that are willing to donate one cent for each kilometer that we drive on the trip to this charity. So one of it is the 4x4 farm and one of them is Horn tools, which makes the awning. Another one is front runner, which makes the roof rack. And the fourth one is light parts, which make the light bar and the spots that we have at the back. And the fifth one is an internet provider from Hamburg, a private enterprise. And by the end of the trip, we're hoping to have raised between four and five thousand euros to build wells somewhere around the world. And so far it's looking good. We've done 15, 16,000 kilometers already and uh, have another 64,000 to go. And by then hopefully we'll be in Patagonia. So on the roof, we originally thought we were gonna have nothing on the roof just to save weight high up. And then we put two jerry cans and the cast iron pot and a box that's got mostly clothes in it that we don't really need. So whenever it's winter, we pack the summer clothes in there, which is what we mostly had. And now having come to California, we switched. So now there's big jackets in there that just annoy us when they're down there. And then we have the chairs and the table on top, which are in a waterproof bag and a mobile fire pit and grill so that we can even if there isn't a, a stone circle somewhere or the proper fire pit that we can still make fire without damaging the environment or causing a wildfire somewhere or etc etc so it's a it's a safeguard for us so we, that we can know that we can leave the fire unattended for about five minutes where we don't go and prepare food but it's also um, one of those things that kind of falls in line with the leave no trace policy that overlanding is. Leave no trace means you go in and you leave the environment as is other than your footprints. You're allowed to leave footprints, everything else you have to take with you. So you take your trash, you take everything, um, every tea bag, everything that you don't can't organically burn so you don't burn plastic ever you just take it with you but everything that you can't can't burn you just take out so so you're not throwing uh, beer bottles against rocks you're not throwing beer bottles against rocks <laughs> you're not um, leaving plastic bottles or plastic bags everywhere or yeah just don't be a dick <laughs> So the light bar that we picked might be, might seem kind of smallish to most people. Um, aboutish small? Aboutish small, one might say, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's, it, it is quite small, but um, it only draws 120 watts and it makes a hell of a lot of light. So with most light bars, you read, like you think the, like with a light bulb that you put in your house, the more wattage, the brighter, and the brighter, the better. But it's not all about how much voltage or how much, how many lumens they generate. It's how the the light gets distributed because there is light that you can use when you drive, and there's light that you can't use when you drive. So, for instance, the light that goes directly onto the hood disturbs you when you drive, whereas the light that goes in front of the hood is the good light that you want. And this. Uh, light bar does an excellent job of distributing light that you can actually use so there's six bulbs that go forward and then there's three floods on each side and 
The spotlights that go forward go about 500 yards and the floods just light up everything that's on the side of the road. So any animals or people or parked cars, annoyingly street signs so you get blinded by them but that's kind of a necessity. Um, but we've used it a lot more than we thought we would because uh, it basically lights up everything that you need to see while driving as though it were during the day and that's a lot easier on the eyes to drive at night that way. So what tent do you have? Uh, we have a Bedouin Comfort 130 which is uh, uh, it's a company that was founded by a very odd Bavarian person that went to the desert and uh, had a horrible experience with all the tents that were on the market so he decided to make his own and he spent 15 years tra traveling between Bavaria and Tunisia to make the perfect rooftop tent and it got recommended to us by people who had done this trip before mainly because there is very little that can go wrong because it's a very basic tent and because it's very quick to erect and put down again. So everything that takes more than two minutes on the road you don't do, ever. So we've got the chairs on the table on the roof and that started annoying us to the point where we use campsites that have tables already put out, basically, or we use other people's. Because it takes more than two minutes to get the stuff off and then back on again. And the same goes for everything, especially the tent, because that's what you have to put up every night in order to go to sleep. So the, this tent doesn't have side windows and the, it has only one window to the front and there is nothing that you have to do in order to erect it that's unnecessary. You just pop open the floor and then you put the tent on top of it and then it's erect. It takes less than 30 seconds to do once you've got the cover off. And the, to put it all back together takes about, including cover, I would say about three to four minutes, depending on how awake you are and what the outside temperature is and that kind of stuff. Uh, talk about zippers, noisy <laughs> zippers. Yeah, one of the things that most people don't realize is that you'll be camping in a lot of wind no matter where you are. It's not just us who have the feeling that the wind's following us around, but the wind is there in general. So when you buy a tent, make sure that it's easy to erect, easy to put down. And when you shake it about, make sure it doesn't rattle because you won't go to sleep when there's zippers that flap about in the wind and make noise. You won't go to sleep if the fabric starts flapping about everywhere and it's you're not going to use it if it's noisy or if it's complicated or if there's unnecessary stuff that you think looks cool but you won't use. And um, so we've had a, a, we've had a, a look through, I think, three or four different manufacturers and thought about hardtop tents, soft top rooftop tents then we thought about the having a pop top but the pop top was too expensive the hard shell rooftop tents you can't get in when it's raining and stay dry and so the only option that we had was that one and um, or, or a soft top tent and then we had to look through different manufacturers and uh, this this one got recommended to us and we had a look and saw why it was recommended and uh, it's mainly because it's easy and it's good when it's hot it's ridiculously good when it's hot actually so because of the guy that developed it went to the desert to test it it's um, not great for anything below perhaps 45 degrees but everything above it's perfect, it's very well ventilated, it's waterproof, obviously, and um, it 
It just stays nice and cool in the sun. Uh, and it's not good below 45 unless you have a sweet uh, sleeping bag. Yes. <laughs> so some of the stuff that you can buy on the market is worth its money and others you can do yourself. So. That amount of comfort cost us in total 60 bucks. It's just parts, the, the labor is not included, but you can just copy any design that you like or you use your, own, your imagination and build something that actually fits your needs. And then on the other side, we have our recovery tracks. These are aluminium or aluminum, wherever you're from. And uh, these are still brand spanking new because we haven't had to use them yet. But uh, I'm sure we will need to in the due future. Um, we thought about getting Max tracks or something like that, but A, these were cheaper, and B, you can bridge with these up to four tons. So you can actually build a temporary road even though there isn't road anymore and not just get yourself out of sand pits. Cool. Show me the locking. Oh yeah. So these uh, are lockable for extra protection. So we put these on this side because behind so that no one can break into the window. And on the other side the table is in front of the window. The most of the time and if it's not in front of the window we're next to it so it's a security thing as well as being useful so we started in uh, canada in on march 1st well, we wanted to start on march 1st car arrived two weeks late and uh, now we're here in lovely sunny san diego <laughs> And going to Baja next, and today. then today actually, yeah, and then uh, to mainland Mexico, and then we'll just head due south and see where the dude in the bonnet takes us. <laughs> how much? How much more time do you have? Uh, Almost two years. So we planned two years for the whole trip. We're three months in, so still have a lot, lot of time to go. Cool. And a lot of miles. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're planning to do your own adventure, save weight and don't save weight on stupid things like cutlery or yeah, plastic forks, plastic this, plastic that. Save weight by thinking about what you're putting in your truck in the first place. So don't take stuff that you don't need. Make sure that the equipment that you take is good. And um, Oh, put some soft light on the outside of your car yeah. so you can actually camp. <laughs> we learned that the hard way. <laughs> the lights are too bright before. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, take your time. Enjoy stuff. <laughs> <laughs>